everyone could just come in and take a seat. Um, we do have, uh, Patty has a word to share from prayer this morning. Um, just something to note as well, we do have the communion elements up front, but we are going to have a time all together um, to take communion at the end, so um, we can just wait for that today. So um, Patty has a word for us. Thank you, Emily. Is this on? Okay. Um, here we are again, and um, I hope you don't think this is vain repetition, us getting up every Sunday, but we truly seek the Lord's face before church begins, and we honor his presence and his voice of what he's saying to us and what he wants to do in our morning ser service this morning. So he kind of um, gave us some a symbolic revelation of the rain, that as he's pouring out that gentle rain today, he wants us to be spiritual sponges just to soak up all of his love, all of his goodness, all of his power, all of his revelation of the things he has for us. And the more full we get of him, you know, like a sponge, if it's bumped, it um, will seep out what it has soaked up. And we want to be able to seek out, seep out him to the world around us and to seep out our love and our appreciation for him this morning as we engage in worship. So let's just be sponges today, taking in all that he has for us and um, letting some of that seep out in our praise and our worship back unto him because it's all about him and in our love and our fellowship with one another.
just like Moses when he went to the bush, the burning bush, the Lord said, this is holy ground. Um, take off the sandals from your feet. Just show the Lord reverence. Close your eyes and just imagine it's you and him. There's nothing else that matters. There, the troubles that you might be facing don't matter. Um, they matter, but they're not going to hold you back. Um, don't let them hold you back. Take them to the Lord and, and surrender them on this holy ground. to your heart. Amazing love, I 
You know, there, there was a time where I was really bothered by during worship to sing songs that are more about us than about the Lord. I know some of you have, have thought of that, experienced that the purpose of worship is to fix our eyes on Jesus, right? To put our soul in heavenly places and remind ourselves of who God is, not remind ourselves of who we are. But the longer I've been ministering to people and the longer I've walked with God myself, the more I realize that every time that we're experiencing a lack of our ability to express love, whether to God or other people, it's because we've forgotten who we really are. Because the reality is once we've received the love of God, and, and how many of you have learned already in your walk that receiving at one time is not enough? It's like you need free refills for life of the Spirit of God. And, and when we haven't been drinking from that place, and therefore we haven't experienced the love of God, we run dry in our ability to express it, even to God himself. So as we sing songs like this, I want to really exhort you to not just sing the words, but believe the words and let the reality that God wants to impart to us become real. Because the truth is that a son, even a son who has sinned, even a son who has fallen short, even a son who has issues, anybody here not have any issues left? Well, I know that can't be true because we're all here today. This is where people come that know they have issues and need God to visit them in those issues, right? So, so when we're in that place, a son remembers that where I belong is at my father's table. I belong at my father's table. I'm not invading. I'm not an intruder. I'm not just even an invited guest. I belong in the father's house. We're a child of God. We behold when we gather the kind of love the father's given to us, that we'd be called the children of God. So we express our love to God that way. We experience this life flow of love from God and then toward God. And then we get refilled in our capacity to love others. Because now we've learned that God really does love us. And therefore, it's safe to love ourselves. This is a word for somebody. I don't know. I hope you are me staying on this for a minute. Because there's this thing in our culture about being a, a narcissist, you know what that is? Somebody who's so full of themselves that all they could think about is themselves. And we've already long since rejected that. That's when we came to the cross. That's what we laid down. Our self-seeking, self-righteousness, self-gratitude and all that kind of thing. All, we've rejected all of that. But sometimes we go too far and keep it that way as if we got to keep punishing ourselves for the rest of our lives. You've been a bad boy. Now go to the corner or go in your room. And we punish ourselves when God said, you're worthy to sit in this place. You're now worthy to sit in this place. We don't come to the Lord's table and say, I'm not worthy to be here. That's a slap in the face to what God's done for us. Patty, would you share that word you had earlier? I know it about um, entitlement. The word you had, that was so powerful. I feel like God wants to impart that right now. You're the one carrying it. Um, during prayer this morning, I just asked the Holy Spirit to reveal to me and to anoint me on how he was, desires us to come out, but that we would have ears to hear and a heart to receive and believe. But I've been pressing in for some things. And we live in a world of broken promises, especially in the political and the government realm where people get into positions of office because they make promises, but they don't uphold them. And the Lord spoke to me that all of his promises are yes. All of his promises are yes and amen in Christ. And we are entitled to them. I worked in a system where people said they were entitled to things and they weren't entitled to them. But God says we are entitled to these things. They are ours and nobody can take them from us. We are entitled to them. And we have to understand what those promises are and that entitlement is and fight for it till we see it come into fruition. And he also spoke to me and said, I show no partiality or favoritism. So often I might think, well, Craig Sheasley's entitled to that or Bill Gerhardt's entitled to that, but not me. I am a child of God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he declares you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And that is the only thing that entitles you to those promises. His covenant that was established through his blood, his broken body and his blood has said, you are entitled to them if you are the righteousness of God in Christ. 
and it's our entitlement, and he shows no partiality or favoritism. For me to say that he favors someone over me is kind of an insult or a slap in his face because he said he loves all of his children equally. So if you're standing for any promises, if you have any needs in your life, you're entitled to them because God has said he is the I am. Whatever need is in your life, he has fulfilled it in the revelation of who he is. So I exhort and encourage you, hold fast to the entitlement that is yours in Christ. Okay, so now not as orphans, but as sons and daughters, not as those who have no family, but as those who have been selected, handpicked out of the orphanage we used to live in to become adopted sons and daughters of the living God. Let's celebrate his love to us. If you found that your love has run dry, I'm not speaking to somebody who hasn't experienced this who maybe isn't even experiencing it somewhat right now. I am every bit as much in need of getting refilled with the love of God as anybody else. As Patty said, there's nobody more entitled to God's grace and God's gift than anybody else. It doesn't matter what office you occupy or how long you've been in Christ. We are always in need of being reminded about his steadfast love to us and receiving that steadfast love if we want to be able to impart it to others. So let's celebrate it and receive it. Come now, God of love, and impart it deep into our soul.
we just thank you so much for your love that that chases after us, Lord. Even when we're not looking for you, thank you that your love does that. And thank you also that when we seek you, Lord, your word tells us that we will find you. And so, Lord, I just pray uh, for this searching heart today that it would find its rest in you alone. Lord, Lord, I just pray that um, this great love that you have for us would sink into our hearts, even those of us who've served you for years and just keep doing what you, you've you asked us to do, but need a reminder of how much you love us. Thank you, Lord, for that reminder this morning. Thank you for um, just being able to be gathered here today as your body and to encourage one another and to spend time in your presence like this, singing and, and hearing your word. Lord, we just thank you for um, this privilege and, and this opportunity. And Lord, I pray that you would just seal in our hearts the work that you're doing in our lives and in this body, Lord. I just thank you that um, anything the enemy intends for evil, that you turn around for good. And Lord, I just thank you that you finish what you start. You're not a God that you should lie. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you, Lord. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. And good morning, Hillside. Good morning as you take your seats on this rainy day. Still beautiful in Jesus. Amen. All right, speaking of rain, I'm just going to share a few announcements with you. And the first, it's sad, but we still get to be together. But because of the rain, we canceled our fall fellowship. That was supposed to happen today. I should say relocated. <laughs> so instead of going to the spot's house, we're going to take anything that you brought, your, your food, or even if you didn't, we're going to gather in the gym and we're going to have um, a fellowship meal in there together. So if you didn't hear that, we're not going to the spots for our picnic, our fall picnic there because of the rain. We're going to go over next door in the gym after service. Got it? So where are we eating? Thank you. <laughs> Here in the gym. All right, next, I have this handy piece of paper. Who has heard about our new directory called a Jace? Okay, okay, so maybe I need to. <laughs> we have a new directory, and it's great, and it, it's, um, you can have it on your phones, and, and my husband showed, wanted me to show that we do have a paper copy for you if you need it, if you would prefer, um, but it's really great. It's a digital directory and it has awesome features um, of being able to, um, excuse me, I need to calm down, um, right from your phone, access um, people's information and contact people in our body. So if you need help with that and getting that set up on your device, my husband, James, James Houtman, raise your hand. He's amazing at that stuff and he can help you if he already hasn't um, to get that taken care of. And thank you. Sorry, I see the offering. Um, let's pray for the offering. Lord, I just thank you so much um, just for the ability to give um, and to share um, with you. Share back. It's really all yours. And so, Lord, we just um, we give you this seed uh, that you would use for your kingdom and for your glory. And we just pray that you would bless it in your mighty name. Amen. Sorry about that. Come on, ushers. Thank you. All right, so Jace, digital directory. If you need help, see James. And if you want a paper copy, you can also see James to get that. All right, Light the Night this year. Light the Night is something that we do um, in place of trick-or-treating. We gather at a house, and we offer games and bags of candy and food, and we just fellowship with people that walk by. Um, we're going to do it at the Blair's house this year, again, and have so much fun. So um, Pastor Steve and Audrey, we're going to do it at their house, and it's on Halloween slash Reformation Day. <laughs> I need to say October 31st. It's a Thursday night. And we're going to gather there. Um, and thank you so much. We reached out for bags of candy. And I think we have all of, or we need some more. Do we need? We'll take more. We'll take more bags of candy. So we put these bags together and we're looking for bags of Halloween candy um, to fill them. Yes. Update announcement. Oh, okay. We have one more location. We're <laughs> definitely on, right? Okay. So um, the Brewers. How many of you have driven past that house and everybody has? Next to the high school in Halifax, that horror show gets worse every year. <laughs> Two doors down, there's light. <laughs> and on trick-or-treat night, 
uh, the brewers are also going to have light in the night in their place. So we're not just, I mean, we're going to give out candy. We're going to love on people as they go by, but we're also going to be available to pray and minister to people. We've had people that have come and shared their need, and the people in that neighborhood are going to know where the light is. So even if all you want to do is intercede and hand out candy, come and do that on either location. We want to do that on a night. Um, the, the church has reclaimed two major pagan holidays already, Easter and Christmas. We're both scheduled on former pagan holidays. How many of you want to take down a third? Okay. <laughs> Change it into a night where Jesus' name is glorified as the Reformation Day really ought to be. Okay, so the brewers are added to that list, just so you know. Thank you, thank you. That's awesome. All right, uh, my last announcement is that Christmas is coming, and that means that our family Christmas night is coming, and that's something that I so love to be a part of. So this year... It's on Saturday, December 14th, on the second Saturday. And our theme, we're so excited about this, and I'm excited to share it with you, is get your hopes up. Okay, so our, our, our Christmas, family Christmas night theme is get your hopes up, and it's just all about the hope of Christ, not just in his birth, um, but in his death and resurrection. And our verse, it's so powerful, and I wanted to read it to you. It's from Malachi 4.2, and it says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. So it's just a night that we want to be filled with hope um, and, and new horizons, and we all need some hope, amen? And we want to share that. So if you have a friend, if you have a family member that you've been ministering to, please invite them. And we'll give you more details as we get closer about tickets and all that stuff. But it'll be a fun night. We always love to laugh, kind of make fun of ourselves a little bit. Uh, we always have a staff video and get a good chuckle. It'll be memorable. We bring our gifts and our talents before the Lord, and, and we sing and do other things. Um, and it will be meaningful. So we're telling you about it now so you can put it on your calendars. And the children, I'm going to be leading a children's choir that they will be involved in, and they'll be practicing during children's ministry. But I would really like you to sign up their names. And Amber, is that sign up out in the foyer? Thank you so much. There's a sign up for you to sign up your child's name. Um, so I know all of the kids who will actually be there that night to sing, even though I'll be back there with them on Sunday mornings. And I think that's it. Sunday starting in November for the kids' practices. Did I miss anything? I hope not. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And Megan, I'm going to call up Megan. Where are you? For the kiddos. So, kids, you can come on up. We're going to get ready to go back to class. So the message today for the kids is come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We are learning about the 12 disciples, so you should be able to go up to any one of these kids and ask them, who were the 12 disciples, and in what order were they called? <laughs> Maybe. They'll at least know the names of the 12 disciples, but the most important part that we want them to get is that they are called to be a special disciple of God as well. So if you guys will extend your hands, we'll pray for our kids. Lord, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for these wonderful children that you've brought here. I ask that you make them just like sponges to soak up your word and to understand the lessons that they are important, not just to be able to answer questions, but to be able to have resources and answers to life as they go. So we just thank you for these wonderful blessings, and we ask that you be with us today. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, we'll see if we can do the gooder before the service is out today. I, um, I've been praying for us as a church, been really praying for the church, capital C, anyway, and um, seeing some things that God's been doing around the world and feeling provoked in a good way, in a good godly way. You know, we're called to provoke one another to love and to good works, and sometimes the church around the world can serve as a provoking influence to a church who's forgotten who she is. And I'm not just speaking about Hillside. I believe that we are on track with what God's called us to be. And I'm excited about what God's doing here. Excited about the transformation going on and some lives that I'm in touch with. Excited about the things that we are prepared to do as a church that God's called us to be. 
not, not just another nice church, but a church that really just goes after the kingdom of heaven. There's really only one building project in the world worth being a part of, and it's Jesus' building project. When he said, upon this rock, I will build my church, he's been working on it 2,000 years, and you and I now get to put our hands on living stones and build the church today. Now, if we don't have the right understanding of church, that doesn't sound all that exciting. But when you consider what the church is able to do when she's alive and well, when the church is fully alive to God, fully aware of who she is and what we're called to be and to do in the world, things begin to take on a whole different expression. Keep your eyes on Iran, for example. How many of you have seen the, uh, the movie, the film yet, uh, Sheep Among Wolves? I haven't had a chance to watch the whole thing, just some clips of it. Iran is alive to God right now. People are coming to Christ by the tens of thousands in Iran. Yeah, where you will be beheaded if you're found out by the wrong groups of people. There is a revival and an awakening in the church in Iran right now that is going to put us all to shame in the United States if we don't wake up and start doing the stuff. All right, so you haven't seen any of the clips yet. That's why you're not jacked up about it like I am. They are fearlessly preaching the gospel. They're doing it wisely. They've, they've mastered what Jesus said, be harmless of, as doves, wise as serpents, harmless as doves. They're doing it that way. But there's an awakening going on in a nation right now that's got all of our attention. How many of you know that if we're not careful to avoid getting caught up in the political wisdom, so-called wisdom, that we can look at countries and actually speak condemnation over them ourselves? God loves Iran. God loves the people of Iran, the ancient Persian people. Pastor Phil has ministered to a man who used to be one of Hezbollah's top guns, literally top men, who is now a pastor and an apostle in the kingdom of heaven in Iran. This man used to order people to go, and he doesn't speak publicly about specifically what specific things he's done, but used to order people to put on suicide vests and go and blow people up in cafes and train stations and whatnot. And now this man is alive to God, preaching the gospel. Pastor Phil had a word for him, and he's one of the ones who's back in Iran right now in very dangerous territory, preaching and teaching the things concerning the kingdom of heaven. The church is very much alive all around the world, and the only reason for the church ever to lose a culture, to lose a nation, is if we forget what we were called to be and what we're called to do. That we are not called to have nice church meetings alone. Man, I want awesome church meetings. I want to wake up Sunday morning, and I do, wake up Sunday morning excited about what God's going to do next. I want to come and gather with the people of God, a people who are alive to God, a people who know that the living God is in the midst of two or three gathered in his name and intends on doing awesome things every time we get together. That, that the living God, when he assembles the saints together, as we're called never to forsake, right? Don't forsake getting together. There's a reason why that made it into the word of God. Don't forsake it. You need it because a building is not just a bunch of building materials laying around in an area. You come on a construction site before the building exists. You got a pile of wood over there. You got a pile of concrete over there. You got a pile of rebar over there and whatever you're building with, it's all laid out on the ground. But when it gets assembled together, now you got a house. And the most exciting building project in the world is wherever God is making a house so that he could dwell. Because wherever he dwells, wherever light has come to be welcome, darkness has to flee. Wherever light actually gathers together. You know, if you, um, I was just uh, camping last week and, you know, been, I love watching the fire. Isn't that hypnotizing when you watch a fire, you know, and it's like all well, the coals are glowing in there and it looks like it's alive and moving around. And you know, you know in a, even in a fire pit, if you spread all the logs out, they kind of die out. So the key to keeping a fire going is you keep all the coals and all the logs together. Everything that's burning has to stay together in one place. Then you have a flame and it gets bright. It provides warmth. It provides brightness. And that's exactly what Jesus is building in the church. The most exciting thing in life is doing the will of God. Anybody who doesn't agree with that statement has never done the will of God. Was that too strong? Okay. Because there is nothing more exhilarating than being used of God to express love to somebody who is falling apart. There is nothing more exhilarating than knowing that I was chosen specifically by the God of the universe himself 
to minister to somebody or to build something for his glory or to do something to express the, the very nature and character of God, especially in some place where it's really dark and really ugly. There is nothing more exhilarating than praying with somebody and seeing them healed from a disease. There is nothing more exhilarating than praying and ministering to somebody and watching life come into their eyes where before they were completely dead, literally even suicidal, and seeing depression just go at the name of Jesus. There's nothing more exciting than that. And I'm exhorting us today, again, let's get in it. Let's get in with Jesus and start doing this stuff. A bored Christian can only happen if a Christian is just doing churchianity and not the real deal Christianity. Because to be a little Christ in the world is to live like Jesus lived. To do as Jesus did. To be out there expressing the love of God with power and with compassion and with all of what Jesus is. There's nothing more exciting than that. So I feel bad for Christians who are bored with Christianity. Because well, um, I feel bad and now I'm going to pray. Awaken us. Awaken us, Holy Spirit. Make us alive to you. Make us understand what it is that we're made for. That we're not called to warm up a seat in a gathering of saints on a Sunday morning, sing some songs, and hear an inspiring message. That we're called to actually bring the kingdom of heaven into the earth. So it looks like heaven just, got, heaven just broke loose in some place instead of that other kingdom breaking loose. So that's the most exciting thing. A side benefit of being about our Father's business, about being about building the kingdom of heaven and the earth is that we're so preoccupied with that. We're so preoccupied with God. We don't fall for the enemy's schemes and traps anymore. We're too busy to do that kind of thing. So when we live in the light of revelation about himself and about ourselves, because we're busy in the father's business, we recognize I'm a son now, I'm a daughter now, and sons and daughters in the house, they minister, they do what the father's business is in the house. That's why we're here. We have a constant reminder of who we truly are and whose we really are. It's when we forget who we are and we forget whose we are that we fall for the enemy's schemes. Like somehow God's forsaken us. God doesn't love us anymore because these tragic things happened in my life. Or maybe because I've sinned, now I'm a sinner and I never even got saved in the first place. We don't fall for those kind of schemes and lies and traps when we're busy about the Father's business because we're seeing what the Father's doing, we're participating in it, we're getting the joy of experiencing the kingdom now come, whether to an individual life, a business, a family, a neighborhood, wherever it is, we get that joy, and it becomes, it becomes like addictive. <clears throat> they're, they're good addictions. You know that? Every, every b negative thing, every negative thing is a counterfeit of something that God wired us for. So we're, we're called, we actually are made to become addicts, just not addicts to things that don't actually satisfy. We're made by God to be addicted to fellowship and love with him. We're made by God to be addicted to joy. So, it, you know, when you're addicted to something, you run to it. It's your go-to thing. When you're a genuine addict, you can't, you've, you, wild horses have a hard time pulling you away from that thing you're addicted to. We're made to be addicted to love. Addicted to the love of God, connected to it so deeply that, man, you'd have to physically drag me out of this thing. That's what we're made for when we're in that place. So our enemy, one of his favorite strategies is to lure us out of that place where we're co-laboring with the Father, where we're actually ministering together with Jesus, building his church, adding daily those who are being saved and building up those who are saved already into the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. He tries to lure us out from that place. Why? Because once he gets us on his turf, remember we looked last week at this place in Nehemiah, this valley. Nehemiah was building the wall. They were having success. The walls were getting up, and, and there were first mockery came their way. They ignored the mockery. Then they physically intimidated them. So they said, okay, fine, we'll build with one hand and hold a weapon in the other. We'll put watchmen out. But you're not getting us off this project. They tried physical intimidation. That didn't work. So finally, the enemy said, you know what? Why don't you come on out here and let's talk? Let's have a conversation. And it was in this valley called Ono, oh which doesn't mean anything like that in the Hebrew, but in English, that's a perfect expression. So you say, oh, no, you don't. You say, oh, no, you don't, devil. I am not coming to speak to you on your terms. I'm not here to relitigate whether I'm saved or not. 
I'm not willing to engage in a conversation where I'm questioning and trying to reason whether God loves me or not. I'm not willing to engage in a conversation that may me, makes me to question, is God for me or against me? Do you remember this is how the enemy brought himself into the world in the first place? Eve stood too long chatting with the devil. If she would have just booked it out of that place, the first time a thought entered her mind, whispering from that serpent that maybe God doesn't have my best interests in mind, man, she should have booked it right out of there. She was the first one to go into the Valley of Ono, and Adam joined her in that place. And in the end, the enemy is really good at what he does. I'll give him just that piece of credit. He's really good at what he does. He's really good at convincing angels to follow him away from God. He convinced Adam and Eve to follow him away from God. And let's not be mistaken in believing that he wants every one of us off that wall. He'll do whatever it takes. And the only thing he can do is deceive. That's the only weapon he has. He is a completely toothless lion, weaponless warrior. But he has a forked tongue. That's where we get that expression from. He speaks with a forked tongue and he's able to convince even saints of God that he's an angel of light. He is a master at deceiving. So we're wise to his schemes and we're wise. We don't go there with him. Don't have a discussion with the devil. It's not worth the time and he's really good. So his aim is to distract us or discourage us. So where does he traffic? What, what does he engage in? He traffics in lies. How do we counteract lies? We speak the truth. We learn the truth in the first place. Let's not be what everybody keeps calling the American church, the most biblically illiterate church in world history. Let's reject that label and let's make it so that it's not valid anymore. You wanna know what God has to say about you? You don't have to ask anybody. First of all, you have the truth of God actually written on your heart. Do you know that in you, you already have a spirit that cries out, Abba, if you trust your inner man, your spirit already knows I'm a son of God. That's my daddy. Abba means daddy. I already know it in my inner man. Then comes this war in my mind. So what am I going to fill my mind with? Will I keep entertaining conversations in oh no? Or am I going to get my head filled with something else? How many of you know, I, I used to, when I was saved my senior year of college, I was having this awakening to God and I was beginning to study his word and look at things, and, and I was beginning to talk differently. And one of my housemates said, man, you sound like you're getting brainwashed. And then I realized later on, you know, I was offended by that. I'm like, I ain't brainwashed. I'm my own man. I make my own decisions. I still have free will. And I was offended at that term. Now I realize we all needed to be brainwashed because our brain was so filled of filth and lies and deception. We needed a total brainwash. Now, you, you do understand that we're not transformed by the removing of our mind, right? That we don't stop thinking, right? That, that's, that's where you actually look like a cult. We're not that. But we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We learn how to think the way heaven thinks. And the best way to learn that, the best way not to, be, not to fall for a counterfeit is to study the truth. If you're not in the word on a regular basis, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm urging you. Your first weapon, your first way of batting down the lies. Remember, Satan came to Jesus three times, and he started quoting the word to Jesus. After the first try, hey, turn these stones into bread, Jesus responded with the word. The next two, Satan started quoting scripture at Jesus. The devil knows the Bible too. In fact, according to James, the demons believe in God. They believe every word of the scriptures. It's just that they twist it in a way to put us under instead of on top of life. So if we find ourselves in lies, half-truths, exaggerations, how many of you know the best lie is based on just enough truth? You got a weakness, the devil will fan the flame of that weakness so it's your whole character now. Every one of us has issues. Not a one of us has fully attained yet. Even Paul, after he'd written most of his letters, he wrote to the Philippians, not that I've already attained yet or already been made perfect. We don't know what Paul's issues were, but he was happy in the light to say, I'm not there yet either. Man, what humility that is, to be able to, in front of the whole world for the rest of eternity to read, hey, I'm not there yet either, guys. Don't look to me as like this guy on a pedestal. There's only one Jesus. The rest of us just partakers of Jesus. 
And he said, not that I have already attained or have already been made perfect. So the enemy will not be able to fan the flame of that weakness and turn it into something that it's not a new identity for us, or rather a return to our old identity. That's where the enemy traffics. He traffics in accusations. As I said last week, we find ourselves defending ourselves. We're in the valley of oh no. The only solution, get out of that place. Do what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah sent messengers back out to those clowns. He said, you know what? I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. Why should I stop the work or why should the work stop? Since if I'm not here, it's not going to be going on. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to the likes of you? I did add to the likes of you because that's his attitude with that. I know you're looking. Don't add to the word of God, right? I'm interpreting it a little. I'm not coming down to talk to the likes of you. I know what you have in mind. There's a trap. You're just trying to get me off of what God has assigned to me so I could waste my time in this morbid introspection where you start, you want me to have a discussion on your turf. No, 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 devil. If we're going to talk about who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing, we're going to talk about it here on God's turf. We're going to talk about it here in the temple of the Lord. We're going to talk about it here where truth dwells, where there is nothing. There is no truth higher than God's truth. There's a great word in the King James, gainsay. It means when somebody speaks, somebody says, yeah, but. You know, man, that yeah, but, that's a dangerous phrase right there. That conjunction right there, yeah, but, that's an argument with God. That's one way of recognizing i got a stronghold. I read the word of God, and then something in me says, yeah, but, watch it. I'm traveling down, oh, no, to have a conversation on the enemy's turf so he can exaggerate, tell you half-truths, and stop you from doing the will of God, which is to build up. There are two aspects of building. We're building the church. And we're building a dwelling place for God in our own lives. We're building something. Our, our work with God. God's building us to be a stronghold for his spirit. You remember when we looked at strongholds? God originated the concept of strongholds. The name of the Lord itself is like a strong tower or a stronghold that the righteous run into. And they're safe. Or they're glad. Exceedingly high above the conflict. God knows how to build strongholds. He's better at it than the devil. The devil builds strongholds counterfeiting what he sees the father doing. Our God is a master builder of strongholds. He knows how to build us up in such a way that when you look back 10, 20, 30 years down in your building process with God, you're going to wonder how you were ever tempted with those things before. You could probably name some things yourselves along you've been walking with God. Man, that thing used to be such a struggle for me. Now I can testify about it without even falling apart anymore, except maybe crying with gratitude for remembering what I, what I used to be, what used to be a thing in my life. That's a righteous stronghold being built. We build them individually, and as we each take responsibility for our own kingdom right in here, our own Garden of Eden of our heart, then we build them corporately. A strong church is made up of a gathering of saints who have tended to their own hearts well enough to be able to build a corporate expression of that heart. That we join together in building something and no words from the enemy, no scheme of the enemy, nothing can get us off that building project because we've seen what God's going to do. We learn how to ignore whatever voice would draw us away from that ongoing work. That's what happens. That's how this thing works. So this is Proverbs. Proverbs 25, 28, like a city that's been broken into, that's broken into and without walls, is a man who has no control over his spirit. How many of you know that one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control? That's in there for a really good reason. When, when the Old Testament, when you see the word spirit, has a lot of different meanings. In this context, it means, you know, when we say that's the spirit, it means our attitude, our emotional disposition. When, when, it's, when we say a man who has no control over his spirit, it's somebody who's just given to reactive living. A city without walls is fearful. Imagine the picture of a city that has no defenses. In ancient times, a city with no defenses, imagine Nehemiah and all of his workers there with enemies literally arming themselves to come and stop them from rebuilding the dwelling place of God, which is what Jerusalem is. And, and at every hour of the day, they had to set watchmen on the walls. They were fearful that the enemy's going to sneak in. He's going to kill us in our sleep. He's going to destroy what God's doing in this place. A city without walls, a city without defenses is fearful. That's what, that's what the picture is. Somebody who lives their lives with no control of their spirit is defenseless. You know, one of the 
the things about parenting, especially the kids in their younger years. I saw this when I worked at the Boys and Girls Club in South Boston. Kids who have no parameters in their lives, kids who have absolutely, have never been trained on how to exercise self-control, how to have some rules and, and guidelines and barriers. They are fearful all the time. Their entire life is based on fear. I react, I'm going to punch you before you punch me. I'm going you know, to steal that thing because I'm fearful. I'm not going to get it again. Or, or whatever the case may be. There's this thing about city without walls. You're fearful. Because there's a feeling on the inside, like I know that I have no defenses against a fear, a scary world out there. People who intend harm and people and an enemy out there who, who lives to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's the picture of the city without walls. We live as a city without walls when we're living reactively or emotionally. Reactively simply means I'm not proactive. I am just responding or reacting to whatever happens around me. Right? So I watch the news and I have a reaction to that news. And that determines what I believe Jesus wants to do in the earth today. We're not called to that. We're the ecclesia, the called out of God. We talk to the Father. We know what heaven's strategy and plans are for the day. We don't react to what the world is doing. We show the world this is the way, the truth, and the life. You're going to want to react to us. Because we have an answer to the issues right here. Living reactively means whatever people do around me, that determines how I live my life. You know, uh, this, this whole thing about unforgiveness, how you're giving people free rent inside your head, the living in your head rent-free. So we live reactively to people. They, we just knee-jerk response. When I say we live emotionally, I'm not suggesting that emotions aren't important, but emotions are just a symptom. Emotions mean there's something going on in the inside. Our soul is telling us, hey, there's something going on in here that you need to tend to. As we looked at with strongholds, the problem's not everybody else. The problem's not the other person. The problem's me. When we find ourselves blaming somebody else, then, then we're just avoiding the responsibility of tending to our own heart. So when I say living emotionally, it means my emotions rise up and I do whatever they tell me to do. Emotions are always real. You can't tell somebody how to feel about something. It's like telling somebody, you know, you're not hungry right now. Yeah, but I feel hungry. No, you can't feel hungry. If we find ourselves saying things like, I know I shouldn't feel this way, but just eliminate the I know I shouldn't feel this way part. I'm feeling this way right now. Are my emotions telling me the truth or are they lying to me? That's the question. Are my emotions making me afraid of something that I shouldn't fear? Or are my emotions making me angry about something for an unjust reason or a wrong reason? Have I leaped to a conclusion? Have I made speculations, right? That's what strongholds are. Have I made a speculation that's caused anger to rise up in me that may or may not be true? Emotions are, are real, but they lie sometimes. In fact, they lie a lot of times. If we live our lives guarded then and defensive, if we've come to a conclusion in our mind that the world's a scary place, I've got to withdraw. I'm going to cover my heart. I'm going to protect myself. I'm not going to express love. We've just shut down the work of the kingdom in our lives by our own determination. If, if a city without walls has a hopeless outlook, there's a feeling like I'm never going to be safe. I'm never, I'm going to be overrun at any minute. Our imaginations are, this is going to turn out terribly. This is going to end in disaster. Or this is going to, somebody's going to get this and get the one up on me, whatever it is. If our imaginations are, th are that way, then we are what the proverb calls a city without walls. So you know what the solution is, right? Keep building. Nehemiah lived in a city without walls. He literally lived in a city without walls. His solution, I'm not going down to discuss with my enemies in the valley of oh no. I'm not going to get my perspective from the valley. I'm going to get my perspective from the mountaintop, from the house of the Lord. I'm going to get my perspective on what should be happening, what doesn't need to be happening from the Lord God of heaven, not from those who live in that valley down there who say, oh no, you don't. So when we live in a defensive posture, here was one last strategy of the enemy to try to get Nehemiah to stop work on the walls. One last strategy. And this time, Nehemiah said, when I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deli De Deliah, anybody whose name sounds like Delilah, just avoid the conversation, and, right? <laughs> so the son of Mahathabah. 
And if you can't pronounce the name, just avoid conversations with them too. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Who is confined at home. I underline that for a reason. You'll see why. He said, let's meet together in the house of God within the temple. And let us close the doors of the temple. For they're coming to kill you. And they're coming to kill you at night. Here's a fear-filled statement from somebody who himself was confined at home. This is somebody, prophetically speaking, who said, I'm not getting out there to do the kingdom stuff. It's just me and Jesus and me and my happy, clappy foursome, and that's as far as we're going to go. We four and no more in this thing. We're staying at home. We're staying where it's safe, where I'm comfortable. I'm staying in this place where I'm never going to stick my neck out for the kingdom of God. I'll never take the risk of rejection or even outright persecution. Oh, no, I'm going to stay where it's safe at home. This is where, like, the church of China, the church in Iran, the church in Pakistan, which is also experiencing an outpouring like that, where they have a word for us. Like that pastor I've told you about from North Vietnam, who couldn't understand why when, when Christians were told you're not allowed to pray in schools anymore. This man had done so much time in prison cells. He was in one that was literally the size of a grave for months. Guards urinating and defecating on him out in the light of, of the heat and sun, sunburnt bugs crawling on him. And this man came and said, so when, when your government told you you weren't allowed to pray in schools anymore, why did you obey? It's like a knife went through him. He said, oh my goodness. The slightest little bit of intimidation and we back off on doing what the Lord's commanded us to do. Pray without ceasing, right? I read that in the book somewhere. <laughs> Why did we obey? The enemy, he goes about like a roaring lion, right? Seeking whom he might devour. A roaring lion. You know what the lion's roar is designed to do? To let everybody know this is my territory. That's the purpose of a roaring lion. So the enemy goes out roaring like a lion, making us believe that he might have actual power over us in some way. So he roars, and if we forget <clears throat> that on the inside of us is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's got not just a roar, but he's got some teeth to back it up. He's got authority from heaven's throne. A voice said, see the lion from the tribe of Judah. And that was the one who was worthy to take up the scroll and unfold history. That's the one who lives on the inside of us. So the enemy roars and he tries to intimidate. He gets us to confine ourselves at home if we're not careful. So then this guy comes and tries to tell Nehemiah, you know what? Let's just go in the temple and shut the door. Let's just hide in the temple for a little while. You'll be safe in there because they're going to kill you in your sleep. These guys, the ultimate threat, they're going to get you when you're not looking. So let's go hide inside the temple. You know what Nehemiah's response was? Should a man like me flee? Could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. That's not a proud statement. That's not Nehemiah saying, do you even know who I am? I'm the governor of Jerusalem sent by the king himself. That's not his attitude. He's saying, I know who I am. And I know that I'm here a part of a great work with a divine commission. I know that the God of heaven is prospering this work. I know that I'm doing the will of God right now. So do you really think that somebody who knows who commissioned him and who loves him and who's called him according to his purposes, do you think somebody with that revelation is going to hide out in the temple? Do you think a church who fully understands what it is that we've been entrusted with, is going to hide out in the church building and have happy, clappy church services where we praise and worship and, and listen to uh, insp hopefully inspiring messages and then do nothing with it? We're not that kind of people, are we? No, we're not. Should a man like me flee? You can say that to the enemy the next time he tries to intimidate you. You think somebody like me is going to flee? I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know who commissioned me to do this thing. You're not going to make me back down. Are you kidding me? I've seen you, and I've seen the Lord, and there ain't no comparison. It's like David looking at Goliath, nine feet tall, spear as wide as that pole right there. He's looking at Goliath. Everybody else looked at Goliath and said, wow, nine feet tall, spear like a weaver's beam. David looked at Goliath, and he looked right through him and said, little man, big God. 
It's a matter of revelation. It's a matter of knowing who we are. Should a man like me flee? Absolutely not. It's time to stop living reactively to the plans of our enemy. It's time to actually be a people who get on our face and seek God and ask him, how today can I put my neck out there? How can I stick my, myself out right now to bring the kingdom of heaven in some place where it's not? Raise your hand if you live in an environment, either in your neighborhood or in your work, where there are voices that try to intimidate you and shut you down. Every teacher, you can raise your hand right now because you work in a public school, and they tell you, don't you dare open your Bible and don't pray with the student. Everyone who works in the public sector, for that matter. I'm going to tell you a story about this. There's this guy, Bruce Wall. He was an a evangelist in Boston back in the 90s. I don't know if you remember this, but back in the 90s, there was this policing program in Boston. They cut the crime rate down from like 100 murders down to 10. And it was largely because of the gang violence. And they gave the police credit for it. But on the street, everybody who lived in Dorchester, Roxbury, everybody knew that's Bruce Wall. Bruce Wall and his street workers, he called them. People that would just go out and minister to the gangs, walk right up to him and love on him risking their lives, going into places where nobody goes. I think I've told you a story about this white guy from Dan, Dan, uh, Danbury, who's like this pencil neck, really small, big, thick glasses guy, and he wanted to do it, and he thought he was going to get killed, and he ended up being the most fruitful one of them all. This old white guy in the middle of an all-black neighborhood, and he went right up to the gangs on the corner to minister to them with a, with a pretend dog. You know, you ever see the magic trick? It's like a stiff leash. So you pretend you're walking an invisible dog? He said, I'm going to go up to them with that. Bruce's like, you're going to get killed. You're not going out like that. And he did it. And he was the most fruitful street worker of them all. <laughs> God uses the foolish things that confound the wise. I, I would have tackled that guy. I would have been like, no, dude, you don't understand. You don't, nobody goes there with that. He did. Anyway, Bruce Wall also worked for the government. He was part of Children and Youth. And he was up there in management. And, uh, but he had a reputation. Even in, uh, now Boston is one of the most liberal cities, and it always has been, in the United States, most anti-church and government mixed together kind of places you could ever work. And he's a high-ranking member of their version of children and youth. And, and we asked him in a class one time, he, was, he came to talk to our youth ministry class, so how do you do it? You have a reputation of being a Christian, you pray with people all the time, and they haven't fired you. He said, well, for one thing, I'm really fruitful and they know better because they'd be missing somebody awesome if they ever fired me. But then he said these words, and I'll never forget it. They might think that they can separate the church and state, but as long as I'm here, they'll never be able to separate the Holy Spirit from the state. The Holy Ghost and state are married because I'm here now. With boldness. He didn't live reactively. I'm sure that there were people who told him, hey, Bruce, tone it down. Don't you put that Bible out on your desk. Stop praying with people who come into the office. Don't you be ministering that Jesus junk as they would put it, to those families when you go to the home, and he never stopped, and they never fired him. He didn't react to the enemy's intimidations. No, he knew what his father had commissioned him to do and trusted his father to protect him. Look, guys, this is a day where, where our nation is in desperate need of a bold and courageous church. That we're not intimidated by mere words any longer. That we're not those who shrink back out of fear for what the enemy might do. I could tell you testimony after testimony of working in a place like that. It wasn't government. But the Boys and Girls Club, they told me at my interview, we see that you're a Christian. You went to seminary. Don't bring your Bible to work. Don't pray with anybody here. It's like, all right. I can minister with one hand, both hands tied behind my back. Holy Ghost, don't know meaning of chains. I got to pray with more people and minister to more people there than almost than I did as a children's pastor. It was incredible. God is able to do it if we're willing to say no more of this reactive living. I'm not going to discuss it in the valley of oh no. I'm part of a great work. And I have a portion of the wall to build. I have a portion of the kingdom wherever I go. That's my part. That's my thing to do. And if I don't do it, that's a portion of the kingdom is not getting built. If I fail in my responsibility with what God's given me, then, then I'm failing in my responsibility with what God's given me. There's going to be a hole in the wall of the kingdom of heaven itself. We live responsively to the voice that calls us upward and onward in Christ Jesus. By the way, if you want to be encouraged in this, 
you got to get out Wednesday nights as we're reading through the book of John. Because this is how Jesus lived, and John brings it out better than any of the other Gospels. He always did what he saw the Father doing, and he was always being threatened to shut his mouth. And remember, Jesus wasn't just like God incarnate come to show us what God could do in the flesh. He was a man who came to show us what a fully submitted life could be. What a life that's fully given over to the Father's will. What that life could actually become. That's what Jesus was. So in everything, every time the Pharisees told him to be quiet, the the rulers of the synagogue, the crowds went to stone him, all these different things that were going on, Jesus never wavered. Why? Because he wouldn't go down to oh no to talk. He had a conversation with his Father in heaven. So what's on the agenda today, Daddy? What should I do right now, Daddy? They just threatened me, and I have a feeling that it's not time for the cross yet, so what should I do right now? Because they want to run me off a cliff. They want to stone me. They want to reject me. Jesus dealt with that stuff constantly in his ministry. We get this picture of Jesus like he was a, you know, his popular ministry, and he was. He had lots of crowds of people, but it also says he knew the hearts of men, and he knew that those same crowds that are shouting Hosanna to the son of David just six days later would be shouting crucify him, crucify him. He was always being intimidated. The enemy tried to shut him down at every turn by every means possible, and he never once did. But that's who we're filled with, guys. That's who is in us right now for the transformation of the world, for the glory of God. So we live that way. So we need to change our conversation. So what I'm exhorting us to, change the conversation. If we ever get the feeling like, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out right now. I have people tell me that a lot. I'm just trying to figure things out right now. Or my kids will tell me, I'm just trying to figure things out right now. Stop trying to figure things out. Remember how sin got in the world in the first place? Adam and Eve eating from a tree to help them try to figure things out. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out one way. I'm just trying to figure this thing out. Stop trying to figure it out. Figure. Stop trying to figure it out. Sit with the Father for a little bit. I'm going to share a little bit more about this in the next week or two, about what it means to actually sit quietly with the Lord to hear his voice. We're in desperate need, all of us, and I'm, I'm back in this place myself right now. Present season word for me. Be still and know that I'm God. Sit still long enough till you hear my voice. So you know what I have to say about this thing. If you've been having conversations in the valley of oh no, hopefully I've described those well enough. If you've been trying to figure things out and the end looks bleak, it's time to sit and listen to God. It's time to actually prioritize, not in word, but actually do it. Where we're just saying, it's just me and Jesus' time right now. It's just me and Jesus' time. I'm not available. I'm not available for other things right now because I know that there have been conversations in my head that are causing me to draw in and preventing me from expressing his love. And so I know I need to hear from heaven right now. Just one word from heaven. All of us have experienced it because when he called us by name, we had the most intense experience of our lives to that day when we came to Christ. But that experience is meant to be day after day after day. And for some of us, it's time to just sit still long enough for God to answer. Instead of just coming to him with all of our lists, I need you to do this and I need you to do that and I need you to do the other thing. And here's what I think we need to work on in me, by the way. Anybody else do that? You come to God with your to-do list? I know these issues in my life, God, so I need you to do something and fix this problem in my life. There's this sin I keep falling into. You need to fix that thing in my life. And by the time we're done praying, we haven't even heard what, what's on God's heart. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or am I like, should I just move on? Because <laughs> this describes a lot of our prayer lives. And yes, I slip back into this too. But that we get before the Father enough to say, all I really want to know, I, like Romans 8 says, I don't even know how to pray. I don't even know how to pray right now. I don't know how to pray for that situation. I don't know how to pray for this situation. But I do know what your, what your heart is, and it's for me. So if Daddy, talk to me. Help me to know what's happening right now. Because every time I get in my head trying to figure it out, man, I, I could go nuts. That's why we do this. Did you know that? You got things swirling around your head? That, this is exactly where you end up, right? Swirling around your head over and over and over again. And before you know it, nothing makes sense and everything's spinning. But he knows how to speak peace in the middle of storms. He knows how to quiet our heart if we allow him to. So... We're going to change our conversation now in a 
experience something. And I want to exhort you with a couple of things. I'm going to ask Lisa to come up and exhort. And Patty, if you still have anything, some things that the Lord spoke during our pre-service prayer. There are certain things that each of us is experiencing right now in our individual lives. Conversations in oh no, if you will. There are things that are inhibiting or making us believe somehow that the promises of God may not come to pass that somehow the end is going to be disastrous or it's not worth it. That, do you know that's one of the ways that our heart convinces itself that it's okay. It's, just, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. This isn't important enough. It's not worth it. Everything to do with the kingdom of heaven is worth it. Even if it's just one little portion. We just read in John 4 last Wednesday how Jesus was willing to take the time after ministering to crowds. He could sit down with one alone woman at a well who was deep in sin and spent however long she needed to help stir up a hunger in her for more until finally by the end of that conversation, she was willing to say, could this be the Messiah? I think I just had a conversation with the Messiah and brought the entire city out to meet Jesus because he was willing to say, you know what, she's worth it. One person, that's worth it. That's worth my time. Busy as I am, that's worth my time. That's one of the ways that we interfere with God. So the conversations that we've been having that have prevented us from fully engaging, sticking our neck out, going after it in the kingdom of heaven, those conversations change when we gather around the Lord's table. Remember his covenant promises to us. Remember his desire and his expected end. So can you guys come, whichever one of you wants to go first, and I'll wrap it up and give some instruction for communion. I get started. Can somebody go check the blue crock pot, crock pot, and turn it on dumb and not low, and some water, maybe? Thanks. Not sure. Hey, I keep smelling it, and I hate to get up and. Okay. All right. Um, sometimes I'm black and white, and sometimes I tell stories. So I'm going to tell you a small story, and I promise to get to communion. Won't be much. Anyway, here we go. All right. Um, I've had back issues for decades. Latest report in June, I think it was, I need two operations. One to help me normal thinking and one to we can af- avoid for a long, as long as we can it can happen because I need bars and plates and all that good stuff, you know. Well, life goes on because he said to me, he said, you won't let anything stop you. I said, what choice do I have? I'm on my own and I need to do this. Simple as that. I believe God. I said, keep going. And that's exactly what I do. These are very normal. And um, they do. They just glare at you. Okay. Well, how do you not look at them? All right. So thank you. Is there somebody down there in the room? Anyways. um, When I got my new house, there was a uh, patch of rhubarb. And I thought, well, I'll never get anything with rhubarb. And so I started making jams and jellies. And it exploded into different wild varieties and all this, all right. So this is a couple years, and I make them known to friends, and they buy them and all that good stuff, all right. So two weeks ago was a craft show that I decided I was going to uh, enter. So I took off work the day before because I wanted to set up my uh, tables, and I needed a practical car, and, you know, I'm loaded for bear. And I no sooner got done and I thought, okay, now I like what it looks like and I can unpack and, uh, you know, tear down this display and I have shopping to do and I have this, that, and the other. And so I was doing, uh, I was on my feet a lot, a lot of carrying a lot of weight. And by supper time, I was in some real pain. So I took my drugs and then I didn't get a lot of help. I didn't sleep real well and I get up in the morning and I think, okay. God, I believe you or I wouldn't take communion every day. But I need help tomorrow. And I admit, I took my drugs. It was just one ounce, one of pill, one and one painkiller, mild painkillers. And I got in the car. But I, well, let me continue on that. I got in his face. I did. I said, God, I need help, and I need it now. And I've been believing you for a long time. And I need you to show up. So I got in the car, 
And I went up and set my face up, and I stood for hours and hours, which isn't something I do to begin with for veterans. And I, I'm, you know, put down my spots, and I came home, and the grass needs mowed. And the crap in the car needs taken in the house. And I was about to sit down, and I was just thinking to myself, you know what? That was all I could do. And I sat down, and I thought, and I have pellets to pull in the house, too. So I went out, and I brought in a hundred and some pounds of pellets. And I finally sat down after uh, I got a chance, and I said, God, you've been asking too much from me. I placed a demand on you to do something that I needed now. <laughs> and you took it from me. All right, let me back up my testimony with some words for you. This is so great. All right, so in Alaska, Sunday's uh, teaching was on communion. And as I read, waiting for my ride to the Bay Church, I got reminded of a scripture I saw here in John, and actually there's several in a row. And so I finished off then, and this is, this is it. I've talked to you a little bit before about this, but um, let's read in John 6 and around 35. Um. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. In other words, our needs are met. We are satisfied. And this is the will of him that sent me, that each and every one who seeth the Son, believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. That's all fine and dandy, eternal life. I mean... We've got that secured, and, and but what about life right now? What about right now? And John 6, 48 says, I am that bread of life. 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Let's reverse it. When we drink his blood, we partake of his life, his flesh. We have his life. We have his life. I'm a testimony of being able to keep on going in, in the midst of what doesn't look like in the world I should be doing. And I'm fine. I'm fine. Joseph Prince tells of a story of a, a little child, I think in India, who began to experience a lot of stroke-like symptoms. Face became very distorted. Um, took him to different doctors. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't know how to help him. And it, he wouldn't go to school anymore because of the ridicule, the problems. And they heard about communion. So the little boy started taking communion every day. And day one, nothing. Day five, nothing. Day eight, nothing. Day ten, nothing. But they kept taking communion. And day 14, the child's body miraculously changed to what it needed to be, what it should have been. All, all appearance of disease or stroke or whatever was going on in his body disappeared. But what if the child had stopped a day Seven or 12, 13. So I've encouraged you before to take communion daily. It is our life. This is the norm for us. We believe in prayer. We believe in healing. We believe in miracles. But God, Jesus himself, set this up as our normal life to get life. So I encourage you, as you take communion today, expect God.
God to do something today. Place a demand on that. But if you don't see results today, take it tomorrow anyway. You know, when you read the scriptures about the uh, um, communion, it says that they went day by day, house to house. So that's multiple times if it suits you. I mean, if, if the doctor had told me, take this kind of medicine three times a day, I'd have listened to him. He knows better than I do. Unless God told me not to realize. But this is what God says to do. Take this, that it's life to you. And I just continue, I, uh, exhort you to continue taking it. Continue. I'm just going to um, affirm that the Lord has really been showing to me um, the gift that he's given us in communion. And um, there's things I'm holding before the Lord that I need him to do a miracle because man cannot do it. And um, he's, he's speaking to me about the authority of his word, the power of prayer, the blood covenant that he's given us, and that is just expressed in communion. And um, as I cry out to him, he says, uphold these things before you, me. So I just lift these needs before him. And he says, I will uphold my word. And um, I often thought of um, just the communion with the blood of Jesus. But now I'm seeing a whole new concept of that, the body of Jesus as well. His body was broken for us. And um, he would not have to undergo, he did not have to undergo the scourging, the whipping, the torture that he did. He could have went straight to the cross and been nailed, but he paused and he went under, he underwent all that scourging, beating, and the stripes he bore was for our healing. And the word of the Lord says, and he'll uphold this word. Surely he has borne our griefs. And in Hebrew, griefs means sicknesses and diseases, and he has carried our sorrows, and in Hebrews, sorrows means pain and suffering, for surely he has borne our griefs, our sicknesses and diseases, and he has carried our sorrows, our pain and our suffering, yet we esteemed him stri stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And when it talks about peace, it talks about a whole salvation, a whole peace, not only in our bodies and our spirits, but in our souls. And by his stripes, we are healed. And all we, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned unto his own way. But the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So I would exhort you today and remember your covenant promises. Remember your entitlements that if you're holding and upholding anything before the Lord, partake of his communion today and thank him for his body that was broken and his blood that was shed, that we might receive the fullness of the entitlement and the fullness of the promises and the salvation that is ours in Christ. And remember that he is no respecter of persons. It's yours because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Thank you. All right, for communion then, we're going to gather around. Uh, we have tables over here. You can gather around in groups of five or more um, around the table. And what I want to invite you to do is to bring something before the Lord so that people can speak life over you. How many of you know all of us are prone to grow weary in well-doing? We all have promises of God that we're holding on to. We have a life in God that we're growing into, and then things come our way. The enemy sometimes tricks us into a conversation down in the valley of Ono to get us off that mountain where we're believing God for healing. We're believing God for restoration of relationship, whatever it is. And when the enemy comes and speaks those things, if we let it sit there too long, it becomes a belief, and we live out of what we believe. So let the saints of God minister to you today as you gather around, and, and just describe briefly. I want to encourage you with this. When you describe whatever the enemy's doing, be brief. Talk a lot more about what Jesus is saying and doing than about the woes of whatever the problem is. You can describe the problem in 30 seconds. The enemy's been 
lying to me and he's been constantly badgering me that I'm not worth I'm not worthy to gather with the people of God, for example. That's that's one for example. And let the people of God then speak the truth over you in love. We're going to speak the truth one to another in the context of the Lord's table because whatever it is that we're doing, whatever we're believing God for, whatever we're building, it was already purchased 2,000 years ago at Calvary. It's already in the blood and in the body. So you can gather around the tables. You could circle up some chairs. But this is going to be, I'm closing out. Nobody else is going to be getting on the mic. So take your time with the Lord. We don't have to get our kids yet for a little bit. Um, right there is the time. 11.47 is when we're getting our kids at work. So uh, get your kids at 11.47 or you'll face the wrath of Megan. That's not scary. She's so sweet. I mean, so, so go and get your kids when it's time. But take your time around the Lord's table and share with one another. And then minister to one another the truth. Amen? Okay. Love you guys. Enjoy the Lord.